Hello everybody, um, so I'm going to have a quick quick talk um, on C-sharp features all developers should know. Um, I'm going to quickly whiz through the boring slides so you have to have the normal ones, so you can look at that later. Oink. So, what are we looking at? So, we're, the scenarios are, you've been a .NET developer for years, you, you, you're starting a new project at work and you're like, oh, I don't know what's going on with this new .NET stuff going on, all these C Sharp 9, 10, whatever. Or you've decided to venture out, like Curricula said, have said, into a new, new job to find a new world and they're, they're using a more modern network. So, you might feel a bit like this. You don't know what the new C-sharp features are, and you're a little bit too scared at this point to ask what they are. So what I'm going to do is run through probably the ones that I find I'm using more often, um, that are very easy to, to, to learn, to, to get used to, um, and then we'll, and it will help you understand and get, in, get kind of familiar with new code bases as you move forward. So the first, one, the first couple I'm going to look, around, look at is around usings. So the first one, uh, as you can see, came out in the .NET 6 and C Sharp 10, is about implicit usings. So we've all kind of started a new, new file and you've got some usings on system and link and generic collection stuff. They have now gone. They, you can still use those types without even referencing them, but with these new project types, they, that will, um, they will appear automatically and it is done through literally an MS build um, project property that you can enable. This is now standard in all the new project templates, so it won't be there when you add a new file, C Sharp file, they're not there. Keeping we moving forward, our global usings. So you might have all these usings everywhere, everybody's happy, and all of a sudden you've got, well, you, the first, you feel like you need to add a region to your usings because they're so high, and you're like, no. Regions are bad. So you look at this and go, well, there's a common common usings, and you don't have to use the system ones. They can be the ones that you have in your own code base. And you can say, well, actually, let's add something in that, that gets referenced across everything in the project. So it is project scoped. So you can add in a new, a new file, and the kind of convention that people are using is like globalusings.cs or include.cs or something along those lines. But you can specify it exactly as you had before but you prefix it with the global keyword. And that will compile it into the, the rest of the project for you so you, can't, so you don't need to kind of reference them explicitly. The one thing I would kind of point out is if you do have very similar object structures between view models and DTOs and entities and stuff, if somebody puts something in here, it might not break at compile time, probably break at runtime, so just be wary. And then finally onto the static usings. So if you do a file new project nowadays, and it's a new console project, you will see this. Now, I'm not going to touch on the why you see this. I'll, I'll leave that to you to do yourself. But this is saying, well, we're, using in, we're, we're loading in um, uh, the system namespace through the, through the global usings. Um, so we're using the console from it. It's fine. But what you can do is say, well, actually, I want to change it to a static using, so I only have to write the, the, the method on that type. To, to reference it. So we explicitly say using the console in system and then we can just write line and all the other things that you have on that type and, and that works quite well. So this works across all types. Um, so your own types as well as the system ones. What I will, would be aware of is that if it's in a larger file and somebody goes, where's that method main, named and where it's used, it can get a little bit confusing because it's not in the file. Where the people are going to use it? So just be aware of that. And then as of C-Sharp 7.2, there was a restriction when it first came out that you couldn't, add, you couldn't reference constants on that type, whereas as 7.2 you can. So in this example, we're using the, the system.math object um, type, and now we can reference pi. You couldn't do that before, um, but anything after 7.2 you can. So the next one is one of my favorites, which didn't start out as one of my favorites, if I'm honest, is file scope namespaces. And we've all seen this, this type of structure. We have a namespace, we have a class definition, we like our indentations with properties and methods and everything. Um, and they brought out this ability to say, well, actually, everything in this file should be in the same namespace. Let's reduce the white space. And you look at that and go, well, how do they do it? Well, you specify the namespace with a semicolon, and then you don't have that added indentation going on. And what that gives you is less indentation, less white space, easier to read. I didn't personally like it when I first saw it, um, but I have now come to, come to terms with it and embrace it. Um, 
The other thing that it does give you, that, that is a restriction, is that if you are prototyping potentially some code and you're like namespace this blah, and then you have in the same CS file namespace this blah, you can't do it because it's scoped to the file. So there is, there is a few restrictions depending on how you quickly um, kind of come up with code, but quite often that's one. Can you not do it with file scope namespace? Can you still do the old? With oh, the, oh, the old the old way is perfectly fine. The, the, this way is still perfectly acceptable. You could have a namespace lightning talk to un underneath it. That is still 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 acceptable. Perfect. And then the one that starts to debate. <laughs> the implicit versus explicit variables declaration. So what does it actually mean? Well, I like to call it this. Var versus new. <laughs> and, I, and you can debate this at the pub later, it's up to you. But back in C-sharp 1, we had let's define everything everywhere. And if you've been doing it as long as a number of people in this room, including myself, you'll be familiar with this. And then we had the JavaScript style var keyword kick in. Um, again, I wasn't a fan when it first came out. It's too much like JavaScript. Very quickly embraced it. Um, can't live without it anymore. And then, in a more recent version, we went with this. So, there's, there's debates, and depending on your, co your team at work, and depending on the way you think, you can say, well, if I, if I want to, to new up something, that's fine, then I'll do it that way. If I want to var and just go crazy on the other side, it's up to you. Um, I've been in places where coding standards have said, if you know what the type is on the right-hand side, then var is fine. But if you don't know what the method is you're calling is returning, then explicitly specify it, and then you get into that whole debate. Um, so it's up to you. But the one thing I do quite like about this is when you're kind of registering services and you have a new, new options type, you don't have to say what the type is. You go new and then set enable true or disable false or whatever you're, you're doing. So that kind of works quite well. So... Moving on, null coalescing operators. So in C Sharp 8, it got a bit crazy with some nulls. So, for example, if we have a, a null, which is a nullable int, and we're saying it's a null, how do we process that? What's going on? So we can say, well, if there is a value, then use it. Otherwise, we're just going to use the, null, the, the 100 value in this example. So there's an inline, inline determination of what, what, what value that you need to use for this. Um, and uh, it's very similar to coalesce in SQL, where you have Add, it, add all the values, it will find the first one. You can also have it as an assignment. If it's, if it's null, it will assign it. If it doesn't, it won't. So in this example, it will output 1, 2, 3. This example was a pain to put together, if I'm honest. <laughs> so the null conditional operator, I would highly recommend not doing this. This is purely an example. This is just to show how it can put together. But essentially what we're doing is saying, if, if the object, is, if the instance is null and the a on it on it is not not equal to null and b on a is not equal to null, then we can then we can be happy to call it. This can be put down to this. So at any point during this operational call, if if it finds it a null on any of these properties, it'll go nope, I'm done, and I'll carry on. So it's a good way to check. Now this is one of the ones that a lot of people don't seem to, in my experience, seem to have embraced. For, and it's been there a long time. So, as we've seen, this is an example I, I, take from, I took from the Microsoft site. Um, we've all defined the classes. I'm assuming everybody's a C -sharp .net developer. And I apologize if you're not. Um, we, we've got, all the, uh, we've got a, a class definition here um, with some properties on it. And we go, OK, well, we want to instantiate some of this. And we want to set some properties on it. So we say it's fluffy, and they're 10. But that's a lot of code. That's a lot of lines of code, which isn't adding any value to, to what's going on. So with an object initializer, we can now say, well, on the same line, um, use the curly braces and say age and name through that property. So if the properties that are there are set in that way, then you can do that. There are some more kind of modern uh, kind of accessor level, property accessor level um, statuses that you that I won't go into in this, de this, this, um, this talk, but you can look it up yourself. But what happens if you've got a, a constructor? Well, you can also do that with a name. So you don't have to set all the properties, but you can use a constructor with the, the, the parameters that it requires. This leads on to the one that I, I've hardly ever seen anybody use, which is dictionary object initializers. So dictionaries are, quite frankly, sometimes a pain to work with. Um, the number of times you have to say, does it already exist? When I add the value in, what do I do? Oh, I've added one in and it breaks. Um, how am I going to work it? Um, 
at some point, I can't remember when, but they added in the ability to say, you know what, we'll angle bracket on the key, set the property. If it's not there, we'll add it in. If it is there, we'll just overwrite it. Happy days. And now you can, and you can as of C-sharp 6, you can do that in the object initializers as well. The previous, the other version that you can do of this is, has a lot of squiggly brackets in. You have to know what the construct is of the key and the value, and it, it just gets a bit of a pain. So I think this one's one of the clearest ways of doing it. A more modern type that, we've, um, that I'd imagine a number of people have come to know and love recently, um, but might be a bit scary if you're moving into modern, modern C-sharp, is the record type. So we've got a class in this example, we've got a developer, we've got a name, or a language of choice. It's a lot of boilerplate code. Do we want to write all that all the time? Probably not. If it's a simple DTO or something like that, we probably don't want to do that. So we can now convert this into a simple record type. Um, this gives the, the properties that you want as, as parameters um, into a kind of constructor. Um, and it gives you extra abilities around um, the, the functionality of these types. Again, probably out of the scope of this, this, um, this talk. This one's a fun one. I quite like this one. So, with the advent of link, we had the, the, uh, the arrow function, and then we had arrow functions everywhere. And now we have more arrow functions, and we can use them in, very, in other places to try and reduce the, the kind of the white space and the noise that angle, uh, the squiggly brackets give us. So in this example, we've got a, pro, we've got a, we've got a person class, we've got a birthday thing, and what we do is, well, when, when it's their birthday, we want to increase, increase their age. That's a lot of white space. But we can convert that to thanks, John. <laughs> we can convert that to, to say actually we don't need the extra squiggly brackets. We add the functionality into the method call, and we and we can add this in here. So this is a very simple example. You can get more more complicated. You don't have to use an a, a, an arrow function. You can you can stay it with the old version. You can stay it with that if you want. Um, but it, it does kind of lead itself more to a kind of functional style. Um, if it gets more complicated, you could find that it might make debugging potentially harder. Um, so you can maybe add in some uh, intermediate temporary variables so, to aid with that. But generally speaking, if it's like this, it should be relatively simple, straightforward. This one was a fun one. It's not a C Sharp 6 specific thing. It's a .NET 6 plus thing. Um, so we've all worked with lists, I'm hoping. <laughs> um, and we've probably all said, I need to find the highest of x or the lowest of x or, or some sort of ordering ordering functionality. So in this example, we've got a couple of people and we said, well, actually, we want to find the oldest or the youngest. And you have to manually do the ordering yourself. So you have to take the i enumerable or list in this instance and say, order it by the type you're working in and then take the first one. So in this instance, you can take the first one because you know there's going to be at least two in there. But if that list is dynamically generated, you then have to look at things like first or, or default, um, added, added extra things like that. And in the, in the later versions, they have now given you these extension methods. So you don't have that added extra stuff. So you can say, well, actually, just give me the, the, the one with the max age, give me the one with the min age. And under the hood, it will do that all for you, um, and it will, it will give you the, the value at the end of it. So that one, I came across that a couple of weeks ago. I thought, that's pretty cool. And then the final one, and probably the most complicated one, and the one I will not be going into much detail about, because then again, that would probably like a three-day workshop. But um, the introduction to pattern matching. Now, pattern matching, if you've done a lot of functional programming and things like that, will make sense. Sometimes it's a bit confusing. Um, but in this instance, you can have some basic pattern matching that will help you understand what's going on and isn't completely crazy. So in the next few examples, we'll, I'll show you, but just based on this, this nullable list that we've got of items, of how we can function, how can we, how can we use this to, to make it a little bit clearer about what you're trying to do. So we've probably all written code similar to that in the past. We, we need to check to see if it's not equal to null and then process it. Now, arguably, you should probably do that in the process method so the caller doesn't need to care, but it's an example demo. So we can now say, well, actually, well, using what we learned earlier, we can say, well, if that's not null and it's any or there's, it's, there's nothing or there's false, then we won't go into the if statement. So that still makes sense. Still, still, still works, but then potentially can you go, well, actually, is that what we're trying to express? R code should be maintainable and readable. readable. Is that as, that's pretty clear, but 
this concept could be um, extrapolated out and be more complicated. So now we get the joy of saying is not null. So this is so is is null I think was in seven is not null is in nine. So we have this ability to say um, kind of use kind of more English language constructs to say what are we checking for um, with in this example. And then you can start adding these things together. So then we can say is not null and there is something in in the in the list. So we've got. So we're saying it's not null, and there's more than one thing in it, well, more than zero things in it, in fact. Um, go and process it. But some people might say that's still actually quite, quite verbose. So you can say, well, actually, is it an object, and does it have more than, more than zero things in it? I don't particularly like this construct myself. I like this one. So you can combine them together and say, is it, a, is it an object with a property of count that is greater than zero? And if at any point that, that is null or it's not, or the count is, is zero, it won't continue in the, in the if statement. So that's a very brief overview of pattern matching. It gets way more complicated, especially when you throw in like switch, switch expressions and things like that. So that's fine. So I think we've almost come to the end. And hopefully you've not been too scared by it. <laughs> the important thing to, to remember is that the, the code that you wrote 15 years ago will still work. It still will compile. .NET will still understand it. It will still process it. So, if it didn't work 15 years ago. Yeah, if it didn't work 15 years ago, well, then it probably won't work now. But, <laughs> but the, if it compiles and it works then, it will compile and work now. Um, so I'd, I'd say embrace the new features. Don't go crazy with them necessarily, because readability and maintainability are, are the key to, to code bases, especially if you work in a big team. Um, if you wrote something that's clever and you don't understand it three weeks later, you probably need to tweak it slightly so you understand it in six months' time. So just want to thank you for, the, for your time and uh, hope that was okay.